no, no. Fuck. I'm t- I'm speaking my truth, bro. This is me, bro. This is my time. <laughs> Cause I've been holding this shit a long time, bro. <laughs> but we gotta put this story to rest, bro. <laughs> Would you guys ever consider playing together overseas one last time? What is going on, everyone? Welcome to Point Game presented by DraftKings. Now, don't forget, DraftKings is your home for all the action across the NBA and gets you closer to the game we all love. The crown is yours. I'm, of course, your host, CJ Toledano, and I'm joined here by my co-host, again, the man, the myth, the legend, the reason why we have this show, ladies and gentlemen, John Wall. John, how you doing, man? What's up, man? I'm good, man. Happy to be back. Get to another episode, man. Get these people what they asking for. Yes, yeah, uh, I feel like you know we've been putting out clips. We put the episode out. Nothing but positive um, reactions. Everyone wants to hear your stories, and I'm like, I- I've just been like creating an inventory of stories I like looked up and read about. So again, this is this has been a pleasure. I'm excited we still got this. Yeah, for sure, bro. Like I told you, CJ, I'm happy we able to collab on this and do something special. Uh, like I said, man, I'm just authentic, authentic, like to give the people what they want to hear, uh, the stories I've been through, what I've been through throughout the league, growing up as a kid, college and all that, that experience that a lot of people don't get the opportunity to see. So, man, it's a blessing to be up here, man. And like, you know what I mean? My due time, I'm enjoying it. Love it. And and so another reason why I'm happy that we're doing this is like, you're, you're a dude who's, you've met and played with some of the greatest in the game. And so like your Rolodex is crazy. And we're, we're really excited with this episode. We have our first ever guest. Uh, one of your longtime friends, teammates, Demarcus Boogie Cousins, will be joining us later in the show. Um, we already got some previews of some of the stories, so I just wanted to tease that, how exciting it's going to be to have Boogie on later. Oh, man, it's going to be lit, bro. Like, that's somebody I call my brother for sure, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, we got this thing we stand for, 3A for life. Uh, the three amigos, me, him, and Eric Blesso. So uh, just to be able to have that around and have that platform, man, it's been amazing. And uh, to call somebody like that a brother, since I've known for a long time, uh, means a lot to me. Dope. Okay. Well, so when we first started this pod, we were in All-Star break. You know, we were talking about the All-Star game or whatever. But finally, the season is back. We're out of the break. Games have happened. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on some stuff. Um, Yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about the wins and losses or whatever. But I did want to get your (laughs) thoughts on this. Last week, uh, I think it was a Suns-Mavericks game. KD is running out the tunnel, and a fan – I don't want to say the word. I don't know. I don't want to hurt anyone's sponsors. Yeah. But some fan yelled out the B word to Kevin Durant, and then KD walked up and and confronted him. Because, again, I I don't need to remind everyone, but players are humans. Thank you. What did you you think of that, John? And have you ever had anything like that happen to you while playing? Uh, In the day, man, like I try to tell people – we're just people that's talented and very special and blessed to be where we are in our position to be good at the sport. You know what I mean? But in the day, we still humans. We go through everything everybody else go through. Um, and that's disrespectful. You know what I mean? Like, in the day, I think a lot of times, like, they want us to not say nothing. But, like, we want to be respectful to those people. But at the same time, fans got to be respectful to us. You know what I mean? Like, they pay money. Uh, we know they drinking at the game. They having fun. They eating and talking trash. And that's all fine, handy dandy. But we still got kids at home. We still have a wife or a girlfriend at home. We still have people that look up to us. And uh, we're never trying to do anything to harm them. But at the same time, you can't disrespect us in that way. And I think Katie handled with Amanda. Like, they'll say certain things, and then we walk up and ask them. And then they be like, oh, shit. Yeah. Like, it's real now. Like, so keep that same energy that you had when you see me walking out. You know what I mean? And it's not like we feel like we bigger and better than anybody or we trying to overstep them. But, like, come on, bro. Like, you, you've been disrespectful. Like, you could have just said whatever you want to say. Kept it moving. Like, uh, it's funny because I seen a clip somebody posted on Twitter the other day. I was with the Clippers last year in Detroit, right? Yeah. And one guy was like, um, come on, John. You only got 13 points. That ain't enough. That ain't enough. And I'm like, bro, this ain't my job on this team to go get 25 and 30. Yeah. Like, that's not my job. And I'm like, I'm doing what they're asking me to do. I'm like, but either one, you can't. I'm like, you can't be a fan. You can't be a bandwagon. Like, which one you going to be? Like, you going to be a fan or you going to be on this side? Like, pick and choose. So, you know what I mean? Just commentating. And the fan posted and was laughing. And I was laughing, too. Like, I wasn't mad because he didn't call me out my name or be disrespectful. Right. He was just talking basketball. And that was cool with me. But they got to learn how to keep it respectful, bro. Because, like, we, we in the day, like, we still human beings. We still got families. We still got kids at home. And, like, what if Katie had a kid and his son asked him, like, yo, you let that person talk to you like that? Like, now you have to explain that to your kid. You know what I mean? So, 
Um, they got to put a, th a thin line between that. I think they may can control that a little better. But then you still can't control what people are going to do once they buy their ticket and sit there. You know what yeah. I mean? And I think they handle the world like where they're kicking people out and things like that and banning them if they need to. Yeah, no, I, I, that's the argument that a lot of these fans will say is like, I paid money to do this. But it's like, you didn't pay money to yell at another human being. You paid money to watch the game of basketball. So I just, you know, when KD went up to him and honestly talked to him like a man, and then the, those those fans immediately like took it back. They're like I got a sports pocket. It was it was embarrassing in my opinion. Yeah, it's like okay, let's say like if I go to a, a speech you having somewhere, right? Right. And you walking out, they call your name when you walk out, and I'd be like, blah blah. Look at that B. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're gonna be like, <laughs> oh, he got to go. Like you know what I mean? Like that's the same as if I'm coming to your environment and being disrespectful and being rude. Like it's cool if you talk a little trash to me, say what you got. I'm fine. I can handle that. You know what I mean? It's basketball, but. To go out your way of being disrespectful and calling me out my name, that's something I would not tolerate, and I think nobody should. And that's the same as if I come to your job and your vibe, you're not going to let me call you out your name. You're going to feel a way about that. And I think that's how people got to look at it. But, you know, some people feel like they're entitled to what they can say and what they can do, and some people don't. So, I mean, to each his own, but I think KD handled it the right way. Yeah, I think uh, I, I read further in the story, like, KD, they were trying to kick out the people, which good, but then KD was like, let them stay. And so, you know, uh, you can tell me better, but players go through this with every away away game that they go through. They got players heckling. Man, at them. you go through it with you go through that away games, and sometimes you might go through their home games. Like, right. don't let you be on a bad team and y'all playing bad and turn. Like, uh, I've been in that position where we was not a good team earlier in my career, and they booing us. So you're like, man, I don't want to shoot the ball. Like, yeah. they might say something bad about me. You know what I mean? But that's the, the, the nature and the part of the game. Like. These people be real true friends, like fans that really love the game. That's a big difference. But to be out your way to call me out my name is something I don't like. But, like, I respect KD because he could have got them kicked out. You know what I mean? Right. Like, now they pay their money. We had our conversation. Let them stay. You know what I mean? It is what it is. Yeah. Okay. So, another story that happened last week, the Heat Pelicans fight. Now, <laughs> I, I don't even know. I don't think I remember you getting that many fights when you were playing uh, in the league. But I, I wanted to know what was your sort of reaction seeing that? Because it was, it was one of those things where it was like, you know, a, a little uh, squirm right here and then a pause and then it <laughs> happened again. So, like, what, what was going through your head when you were watching that? For me, it was funny because the fight all started because the Pelicans felt like Zion got fouled the wrong way. Right. You know what I mean? And – it goes back to, like, guys went through all this, and Zion was like, I don't think it was a dirty play. Yeah. So it was like, we went through all this for what? You know what I mean? Didn't care, yeah. but I didn't care. But I respect it, though, because, like, Najee Marshall, like, I know him from D.C. and stuff. Like, he's, te he's, he's stepping up and protecting his teammate. You know what I mean? Like, Zion's a superstar on their team or a star on their team. Like, he's protecting him. And then, you know, Jimmy Butler's the bruiser, one of those guys that backs down for nobody. I love and respect the way he plays. Yeah. You know what I mean? What he brings to the game every night. So, you know, he's stepping in there. He ain't backing away. And then you see a choke. You're like, whoa, whoa, what's going on right. there? Like, so that turned Jimmy to another beast. And then, you know, Najee wasn't backing down, being from where he's from. So I don't ever think nobody really going to fight. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, you know what I mean? He did battle, whatever's going on. And uh, it's a part of the game. You know what I mean? I don't think nobody really is going to throw no punches. You know what I mean? Like, this ain't the old days when they really was throwing punches. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, now in the NBA, it's a little different. I just see punches thrown. I'm like, what in the world? And I'm like, TB, come on, bro. Like, I know Jose. Jose is not backing down for nobody. You know what I mean? Small or not, like, you know what I mean? He's not backing down. Uh, he reminds me of my brother, like, my brother Reggie Jack. Like, he, like, got that small people syndrome. Like, if he thinks somebody's trying to play him, he's going. And I'm like, TB, why are you fighting him? Like, come on, bro. Like, what are you doing? So, like, it was funny to see that. But, you know what I mean? Like, glad nothing major happened. I think the NBA handled the way they're supposed to handle it. Uh, the tough part about all that is, like, you – it's like it's a foul, but then you got guys that want to run off the bench and see what's going on. Yeah. Then they get they miss a game, but uh, it's just a heat of a battle, man. You know what I mean? Like nowadays, any like any type of foul is a flagrant, or you might be ejected. You know what I mean? So it's a lot different when I first came into the league. Like I remember coming across the lane, you get hit with a shoulder, right? Like get up, like hey, we ain't calling that, like you know what I mean? So it's a lot different. I think the game is changing. I mean, it's evolving, but I don't think that was too much. It was too bad. It was just a little. I mean, conversation. Yeah. Did you ever get Keep in a it fight? moving. Did you ever get in a fight while? while I got there? into it, man. Like, um, I think it was my rookie year. Rookie or second year, we was playing my, uh, who was he playing? Oh, he was playing. I, I know I got into it with, uh, what was it, Big Z. Zadrunas? No, nah, Galskis, yeah. Oh, wow. That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah bro, so it would have like, been like Miami if it was your first year, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Bigger Galaxy, yeah, it was in Miami. Yeah, yeah. when Brian then was there. Um, we at home, right? Yeah. You know I mean, not saying I was like, I was, I was good. I was figuring out my way in the league right. and playing well and stuff. And coach was like, man, don't get into it, nobody, man. Like, don't get into it. You know, like, because at that time, you know, older guys are, do little stuff to get a young guy going and try to get him out the game. You know what I mean? Especially if he's impacting the game in a big way. And I, my rookie, I was impacting the game a lot. And he elbowed me. And I looked at the ref because my lips started bleeding. I mean, I touched my lip. My lip yeah, bleeding. I looked yeah. at the ref. He ain't called a foul. He elbowed me again. I was like, no, nah, they got me effed up. So I tried to uh, <laughs> throw one of them, but I jumped. You, you, but you I had only, to, right? But I only hit him like right here. <laughs> hey, bro, I only hit him like right here. And then we get to like tussling, tussling. He's trying to grab me. I'm trying to move away. I'm probably like 195 soaking wet back then, yeah, bro. Yeah. Like I ain't strong or nothing there like that. And uh, they break it up, and then I got ejected. I was like, man, damn, coach told me not to get ejected. Don't let him get to my head. And boop, here I go out of there. But I had like a lot of competition, a lot of confrontation with a lot of people. But it just be basketball talk. Like right. me, I'm one of those guys that I get going. I like to talk trash. You know what I mean? Like that's how I play. That's how I get myself going. And uh, but ain't nobody really fighting or doing nothing out there, man. Right. It just be a lot of woofing. That's what I'm saying. It be a lot of it be a lot of woofing because if it's really gonna be something, bro, like you always can be like, we gonna see each other in the summer somewhere, or we stand in this city, we going to go dinner somewhere. You know where to see somebody. Right, you want right. to see somebody, so. It's really nothing, bro. Like, it just be a lot of woofing for real, bro. Like, if people really was on that, you know where to find me at, bro. Like, we ain't ducking no smoke. Right. That's why I always feel like there's a lot of – you see some of these fights as a fan, and you're like, oh, that guy is kind of charging at that other player with the, with the knowledge that, oh, he's going to be held back by his teammates. It's almost just kind of like a oh, like an emotional type thing. Like, I, I'm, not st- I'm not standing down. You know, this is me. CJ, I'm going to tell you the funny – this is what it is, bro. It's like, you know, you got that one kid in school that'd be tough, tough, tough. Right, right. So they can, they be right in front of each other for about 20, 30 seconds. You could fight right then and there. He quiet, just yelling back and forth, pushing, pushing. The teacher or the principal come and grab you. Now it's like, oh, no, I'm trying to fight. Like, what's the word? Like, what we on? Like, come on, bro. You capping, bro. Yeah. Like, we could have been unshot the ones real quick, got this over with. But you ain't know that. Like, it's cool. Like, I ain't mad. I don't, I'm not saying guys and anybody won't fight. They have to. But it's a business. Like, who really want to lose that much money? Ain't nobody trying to lose no check like that. But is there like I I don't want you don't got to name names if you don't have to, but I'd love you if you did. Is there like a player or two that would fight where you're like, oh, that dude's kind of crazy, doesn't care about you know paying a little bit of fine, you know, like a James Johnson? Oh, I got another story. I, hey, bro, that's what's, hey, ain't nobody. Man. That's what I'm saying. Like, hey, I'm be honest. I met James Johnson. He was that way for us, bro. And they tell me what he was. I was like, yeah, that guy gonna be my friend when I get to the league. Like I ain't backing down for nobody, but. Yeah, he one of those ones I don't think nobody wants to smoke with. Like I remember him and Serge got into it one time. I think Toronto. They was in Toronto and yeah. Serge swung on him moving it. He two he two piece Serge. Serge's like, no, 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 we good, we good, we good, we good. So like, you know what I mean? Certain ones you know who to try. Like, I mean, people know who to try, bro. Like, they know who they really want to smoke with, who they don't. What was the story? Did I cut you off? Were you gonna tell a different story? Now I got it. Like, uh, it's funny because um and Quincy AC, my guy, bro. My yeah. guy, like, I met Quincy AC at Reebok, uh Ryu Camp when I told you he was on my yep. team. Uh, I took visits to Baylor when Quincy was there. I mean, about to go to Baylor and stuff. And we was always cool. And we playing the Knicks on Christmas. We went in and I'm driving. He just, boom, chucked right. me hard. I'm like, yo, what you on? So I go back and push him back. And then he tried to swing on me and stuff. But, like, we cool, nothing like that. Yeah. But, you know, I think just in the heat of the moment, he probably was, like, frustrated how the game was going. You know what I mean? Especially being on TV. But at that moment, I'm like, man, dang. I got to fight this dude, bro. You know, Quincy a little crazy. Quincy be turned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like an enforcer in the league, like Boogie who we're yeah. about to talk to. Yeah, but, he, yeah, but I, I got love for Quincy. But at the time, I'm like, man, you, you can't play with me like that, bro. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, but it is what it is, bro. Like, me and Boogie got into it before in college. Right. Like, you know what I mean? It's the love of this game, bro. Like, brothers going to fight. People going to fight, argue back and forth. Uh, ain't nobody going to be perfect, bro. But, like, I don't think anybody really wants to do anything. Back in the day, you would have seen some some blows thrown, two right. pieces and all that. But now people ain't trying to go viral on social media, TikTok. No, that's what I saw. I remember in, in that uh, they did that, like, Redeem Team doc, and they showed how Kobe, like, he told everyone, I'm going at Pow, oh. you know, in that first play. And, the, you know, I mean, we've we seen how much love and, like, Pow, you know, taking care, helping taking care of Kobe's, like, family Yeah, now. for sure. Yeah, but, real like, family. They were brothers then, and Kobe went right at him, ran right through him. And that's almost, in a weird way, that's a little bit of love. Like, hey, man, we're on the court. We're, we're playing against each other. Yeah, it's no love. Like, that's what I try to tell you, bro. Like, like Boog, E-Blit, play all those guys when I'm in the league, bro. Like, no, you're not my friend right now. 
We're going to dab up for the game. Cool, boom. Let's get to it. Okay. Like, we can talk about, we can jitter afterwards. Between those lines, that's how I'm feeding my family. You know what I mean? And they, and they doing the same thing, so it's nothing against them. We're going to talk trash. We're going to do all that. Like, but I know after the game, it's all love. You know what I mean? But Kobe sent the message. Like, we, we're here for one thing, one thing. I'm here for USA. I'm here to win gold. Yeah, that's my brother. This is the one I compete with during the season against all you guys I'm on teams with. But I'm showing you how competitive I am. They thought he was playing. And I just say that. Like, that's Kobe mindset, this competitive drive. Like, I feel like that's how he was when we was in the All-Star game, bro. Like, he's picking up 94 feet doing that. Like, he just always had that that drive, and you can't really teach that. Like I said, for me, like, for a lot of guys I played, you know I mean? I played against KG. I know how he is. But I say, like, point guards, I would always say Russell Westbrook, man. Like, yeah. Just the energy he brings every night, bro, like all-star game, like anything, bro, like he brings that tenacity. And, like, a lot of people be bashing him about this and about that. He's not the same, Russ. It doesn't matter, bro. Every night he's giving you whatever he got. And that's what you got to respect about that man. Yeah. We need more players like it, to be honest. Um, okay. You had mentioned you and Boogie may have gotten to it. You guys are brothers. But, like, you get heated like that. I want to hear more about those in specific stories. Uh, so we're going to take a break. And when we come back here on Point Game, we're going to have – Demarcus Boogie Cousins on the show. All right, welcome back to Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano, presented by DraftKings. We are so excited. Our first ever guest here on Point Game, Olympic gold medalist, four time NBA All Star, another Kentucky legend, which we're going to talk about a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, Demarcus Boogie Cousins. What's up, Boogie? I'm good, bro. I'm solid, man. Just enjoying life, uh, you know. On the new ventures, doing things like this, which has been really cool. So, uh, you know, things are on the up. So, just enjoying life, like I was saying. I, I know you do a lot of these podcasts, but how does it feel to get on this podcast with uh, your friend and your brother here, John Wall? Oh, man, I'm, I'm a little anxious, man. <laughs> I, I know how things get when this dude <laughs> – I know how things get when this dude get a camera in front of him. So, I'm a little nervous, but I'm, I'm with whatever. I'm the homie that's going to ride. I guess and I, this is a question for both of you guys. We can start off here. Do you guys remember the first time you sort of met each other and, and saw each other play? Like, what what, what was the story there? <laughs> I'm telling you, you five. You go first. I got the second part. You got the first part. Uh, it was in Detroit, right? Nah, that was, uh, yeah, Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan, yeah. All right, boom. So, uh, we doing a tournament. In Detroit, Michigan. I don't even remember the name of the tournament. This had to be freshman year. Or, no, eighth grade. Eighth grade, eighth grade, going to freshman year. Eighth grade, yeah, yeah going to freshman okay. year. So, uh, you know, we playing this team, whatever, and it's this kid that's just, like, blazing fast. Like, the, the team was cool. Like, they was a decent team. But it was just this one kid that was just, like, flying. Like, and he was having, a, you know, a good game, but we was, you know, kind of kicking their ass. So, um, it's this play where, you know, this same kid gets a, you know, a crazy dunk. It, it wasn't nothing crazy, nothing like, you know, outstanding, but it was a nice little dunk, especially for that age group. So we got the dunk and the crowd went absolutely nuts. And I'm just like, like, who the fuck is this? Like, what's, like, what's going on? Like, so we finished kicking their ass <laughs> and, uh, you know, we get to chopping everybody after the game, you know, I'm John, whoop de woo uh, things of that nature, and, uh, you know, that was kind of the beginning of our relationship. So, uh, you know, we kind of hung out. It was a big tournament, so we hung out outside of the uh, game, things like that. And, you know, that was the beginning of the relationship. So, uh, I'll let you tell the rest, Fi, when, yeah, when we meet down it, the road. <laughs> yeah, it was it was crazy, though, because uh, I ain't never really seen nobody, like, at the height he was. He was skinny as hell, though. Like, I was skinny as a toothpick. And I'm like – Damn, like, this nigga can dribble, can shoot, he got moves. And I'm like, who is he? But I don't know who he is, you know what I mean? Because I never really told you, growing up, I never traveled. I never really played out of the state of North Carolina. So I get the dunk, and I'm shocked myself. Like, this is my first time dunking on somebody. I used to just barely dunk at practice. And uh, we chop it up afterwards. We kicking and talking and whatever. And uh, we just start building the bond, building the bond. So my next question I got for you, Boogie, is, like, when did the point to, like, we thought we wanted to go play college together. You know what I mean? Like, when did we try to figure that point out? Uh, I would say that last year at Bron Camp, right? Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, I, I just found it crazy, like, because um, the way the rankings worked, it, you know, it was every year was a new guy, like, or it may stay the same. You just, you know, it depended on the year you was having. So when the, when the rivals rankings first dropped, I was the first guy to be named number one in our class. So I kind of got my name from that, and uh, I was still kind of an unknown. Like, I wasn't really on the scene like the rest of the guys were, the Renardo Sydneys, the, you know, the Lance Stevensons, the Xavier Henrys of that nature. So, you know, I was a little off the radar, but I had a name. So, uh, you know, I kind of walked in camp, and, you know, guys kind of knew who I was, but at the same time, they didn't. Like I said, I'm under the radar. So um, I was, this is – this is the last year, which was going into junior year, right? Senior year. Senior, 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 junior. senior Okay, so senior. both. Perfect. So we walk into camp, you know, our last camp, which is junior year going into senior. By this time, you know, five is, is make well, John is making a name for himself now, you know. Uh, and, you know, this is on our way out of high school. So at this point, the rankings are pretty much solidified. Like, they pretty much know who they consider the best guy in the class to be. And at this time, it was John. So uh, John popped on the scene that summer, and it was it was it kind of like it was kind of like a I don't know you kind of hit the lottery that summer, five like <laughs> you know yeah, you, had was, just, you had one crazy tournament and then boom that's all you was hearing John Wall John Wall John Wall John Wall, and I'm like that's that motherfucker <laughs> I met in Detroit like <laughs> I'm like oh this is crazy and it's in my head I'm like damn it's crazy how this shit just kind of work I'm like damn I watched dude get his first dunk to now they're talking about this is the next D Rose Tyreek Evans potential number one pick so I'm like damn this is crazy so we walk into camp and everybody kind of giving you know fire the stink eye like you know like the fuck is this motherfucker <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> no cap so, look so I see my dog I'm like hey fire hey come over here nigga like <laughs> Come sit with me, bros. And yeah. it was right. It was right where we left off. Where it was, you know what I'm saying? Like those two kids in Detroit that you know just fans of each other's game, and we became friends. So we kicked off from that point too. And and at that camp, you know, we really became closer. And um, that's when our relationship and brotherhood really began. So uh, after that camp, it's like, hey man, what's up? Like, what you trying to do for college? And at yeah. this time. You know, my silly ass committed to UAB. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I'm like, yo, I'm sitting here trying to, hey, man, what you, you know, would you ever think about UAB? And, and like I said, you hear how the hype is about this guy. We talking potential number one pick. And I'm sitting here trying to convince this guy to come to fucking UAB. <laughs> so this dude, like, man, it ain't a chance in hell. But these are the, these are the you know, schools I'm considering. And, I would say we had, what, two out of three of the same schools, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know NC State was one of them. What was the, what was the Memphis. other Memphis. Memphis was the one. Remember, we didn't have Kentucky. We had Memphis. Outside of Memphis, though, because that's where we, we ended uh, up. But it, it was one other school. Uh, I'm trying to think. You didn't have Miami on your list. Nah, but they started hollering at me once they knew yeah. we were trying to go to school yeah. together. I really think it was just I'll be honest, bro. It I might, think it you was, might you might be right. It might have just been where it was Memphis and um Yeah, I think NC Memphis State. NC State for sure. Right. So uh, you know, um at this point, you know, my steam is I, I ended up decommitting from UAB and now my recruitment opened yeah. back up, but it wasn't really a long process for me because no. in actuality I always knew I wanted to play for Cal uh and go to Memphis at the time. So uh I believe I committed first, right? Yeah, but you gotta think. You gotta tell him you you really fell in love with Cal because who you grew up wanting to be like. You know what I mean? Watch oh, him yeah. play. So uh, you know my my first collegiate game I ever went to, and I like actually knew what was going on. Um, I got to see it was my seventh grade year. I got to see UAB play Memphis, and I had no clue about Memphis, no clue about Cal. I was just I got some free tickets. I'm like, fuck it, I'll go to the game. Like. <laughs> So uh, I'm seeing this guy play, and it was uh, Sean Williams. So I'm watching him play, and I'm just like, damn, this dude tall as hell. Like, he like, I'm kind of trying to size him up from the side. Like, I'm like, this dude, like, he about my height. And he handling the ball, he's shooting threes, he dime, and I'm like, that's how I want to play. But we kind of came up in the era to where it's like, shit, you 6'5 up, you put in the right. box. You playing on the post, bro. Like, that's just what it is. Like, <laughs> So, um, you know, Sean Williams inspired me with the way he played the game and at the level he was playing it at. So um, I'm like, 
for the most part, I'm trying to get these coaches to get on the same page with me. Like, I want to play like this. The coach is like, nah, you need to do this. So I'm like, man, I think the only way this going to work is if I go play for a guy like Calipari. And this is just, you know, I'm a child trying to, you know, figure shit out. I don't really have a plan. I'm just thinking this is my way of making it work. So we fast forward back to what I was saying with, with, with camp and shit. Um, we now trying to figure it out. Uh, I think Duke came in last yeah, that was right. Duke, like Duke was just something like uh, they just ain't really fit me. You know what I mean? Like I really wasn't a Duke type of guy. <laughs> yeah, be realistic. Right. Like where, where, I'm, where I'm from, I don't fit that type of thing. So I know, like you I'm like <laughs> my AU coach at the time, Brian Clifton, wanted me to take a visit there. You know what I mean? I know about Coach K and their historics about it. And I'm like, or right, I'm just gonna take a visit because it's right up the street for me. But in my mind, I'm like Boog ain't not coming here. I know this. It ain't happening. So that's off the radar. So we started putting NC State on the radar a little bit. So uh, I went on a visit, and Derek Favors was there with me. And this is book rival in high school. Like, who was the <laughs> who was the better one? You know what I mean? Uh, I never forget. I'm seeing them play on TV. Book is demolished, and I'm like, damn, this one going coast to coast, spin moves. I'm like, all right, this motherfucker really like that. So me and Derek Favors had took a picture throwing up the Wolfpack, and Book texts me like, "What we really doing?" I'm like, "Bro, this just for this shit. I just got to do it." <laughs> So, uh, Boog ain't noticed, but I, t I told him this story earlier. Boog, I, I called Boog. I'm like, yo, bro, I'm about to commit to Duke. And I hung up on him. Oh, bro, I'm talking about, do you want to tell me how many times he called me all type of names? Bro, you really sold me out. You doing this. <laughs> <laughs> bro, I was sick. I remember that like yesterday, man. And it was like coming down to the countdown. And like I said, it was I the wire. Knew. It was to the wire. Yeah. I was and the last you were the one. the last guy to commit. So, Leading up to that fucking phone call, dude telling me, I got, like, bro, I got you, bro. Like, we going to school together. I'm like, all right, bet. I'm just waiting on bro to announce. So he called me, and it was maybe an hour before. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know why I feel like it was a deadline or some shit. Like, it, w it wasn't a deadline. Remember, I had already made an uh, announcement what day I was going to do it. You know, like, you come right, on, like, correct. If you go to Rivals of Scott, they'd be like, all right, Friday at 2 o'clock, John Wall correct. or Demarcus Cousins committing to this college. So I correct. called him an hour before, but like, bro, before you hear the news, don't be mad, but this is where I'm going. <laughs> and like he said, he called me. He, he gave, and that's exactly how this phone call went. It wow. wasn't like, you know, hey, bro, it wasn't like easing in. and It was like, hey, bro, what up? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go to Duke. Click. And I'm like, yo, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> so I hit back. I called, bro, like 10 times. Like, yo, like, what's up? Like, nah, no, I waited until I got to the press. <laughs> so... Yeah, so I, I go to the press conference. I go to the press conference at my school, and uh, my mom did not like the media, bro. Like, hates the media. Like, coolest mom in the world, but hate the media. So she wouldn't go on stage with me. I had to get my sister to go up there. And then he seen where I went. But it was all made it done. But like you said, when I seen D. Rose play the first game in the Garden, bro, against Oklahoma, I said, no brain to what school I'm going to. Only thing we had to figure out was Cal called and was like, I'm about to leave Memphis and go to Kentucky. And I had already took a visit there uh, coming back from the camp in Chicago. And I was like, all right. I went there and killed, like, playing against the guys. And I'm like, I can go to the school, but I just couldn't play for the coach, Billy Gillespie, at the time. I didn't want to play for him. And once we soon Kyle went there, we knew the history about basketball. So that was a no-brainer for us. But, like, once we went to the camp and locked in even more and exchanged numbers, like, like I said, there had been a brotherhood from, from that day forward. Uh, I think basketball fans are, like, extremely thankful you guys went to Kentucky because that was – one of the most legendary squads, not even like all five starters. People don't know all five starters in the first round. Like even just from the, before the season, midnight madness, I was rewatching the video. You guys were like the Beatles. Like, I know it was like, pep, it was <laughs> like up, you guys were on up. cherry pickers. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to ask specifically, yeah, cause like it's even in like the character of how, you know, I know you guys like boogie, they cut to you. They introduce you. You're, mm -hmm. Stone face, just like cold. Like everyone had right, was right, in their right, own right, personality, right. but why were you so serious? <laughs> All right, so I tell this, you why. Hey, no, no, fuck. I'm I'm speaking my truth, bro. This is me, bro. This is my time. <laughs> Cause I've been holding this shit a long time, bro. <laughs> so when it came to Big Blue Madness, Cal gave me this crazy speech, like. Cause I was like, yo, I'm about to go out here and I'm about to, you know, I'm about to get jiggy mm -hmm. out here. Like we gonna get the, you know, the crowd hype, whoop de woo, all that. 
So Cal overhears me and he like chews my ass out before Big Blue. When you go up there, you act like a professional. I don't want to see none of that silly shit. Whoop de whoop. I'm like, all right, Cal, my bad. I got you, bro. My bad. Like, man, I got ahead of myself. My bad. <laughs> so cool. Like, we never really rehearsed like right. the entrance and all that coming out. So everything was like first take. So like I said, my mind was made up to do one thing. Then Kyle kind of got on my ass about it. So once we get on the little railing, like, I'm one of the first people to come out, too. So yeah. we get on the railing, and now I'm like, oh, this shit's, like, kind of wobbly. And it's putting us probably 12 yeah, feet yeah. in the air. So I'm like, oh, this shit, like, kind of wobbly. So And I'm afraid of heights, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, Yo, so when I got up there and they started raising that motherfucker, I'm like, oh, shit. Like, I'm literally about to shit myself because I'm, like, terrified. <laughs> but at the same time, we standing in front of 60,000 people. So I'm like, bro, just keep it cool, bro. Just, you know what I'm saying? Just keep it cool. So the results was what you saw, which was me looking like I was scared shitless. But mm -hmm. on top of that, after the speech from Kyle, John went out there and became this iconic guy. John Wall dance. Doing, <laughs> doing, it wasn't even supposed to be my dance, bro. That's my dance, bro. Hey. Hey, hey what they say? Bro, bro. Hey, they say don't miss your blessing. Boy, boy got there and got <laughs> shook. I took over. This but dude not, went up there and did this shit. It was funny, dog. Nah, nah, but honestly, bro, you was the perfect dude for it because ain't no way in hell I would have been able to carry that, that shit the way you did, dog. It was so crazy. <laughs> it, it's so crazy at the time because, like, me and Book, if you go even go, like, not even go too far forward, it's like we go to, after we get drafted, we the only ones dancing at the rookie transition. Like, we always was the one before every Kentucky game. Like, if we want dancing, we want winning the game. Like, we want locked in, we want lit. So we just had that different – demeanor and domination with each other bro like i'm not saying we on Shaq and kobe level but like that's the right. bond we had when we played like we knew how dominant we could be and uh, we took that through college so that midnight man it was like it won't pull to be like that but when it went like that i was like damn but rock stars bro we was that like and we I, put college we put college basketball back where it wasn't at. it was dead for a long time bro absolutely and the crazy thing about it you know i you know i tell that story with you know a sense of humor behind it but like i was saying like Everything that played out with, you know, our time at Kentucky happened exactly the way it was supposed to. Like, everybody ended up benefiting from it in the exact way they were supposed to. And, you know, you take something as small as, man, I was supposed to be the one dancing. That's supposed to be my song. But yeah, like I yeah. said, if this dude didn't go out and do what he did, like, the rest of us don't shine the way we do. You know what I'm saying? So, in a way, I could be pissed about it. In a way, I'm, you know, I'm happy about it because everybody benefited from that moment. What about Josh Harrelson? Do you guys remember his dance? <laughs> Jorts. <laughs> Jorts, man. You talking I about Jorts, that thing. I was like, we don't talk about Josh Harrelson's dance enough. Hey, Jorts, man. Jorts, from what Jorts was on our team, bro, to do what he did the year after that, bro, it was amazing to see, bro. Because yes, nobody would ever thought he would be a starting center and doing what he was doing at Kentucky and take them to a Final Four, like – Bro, that, that motherfucker got drafted. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> if you got drafted, bro, if like, you watched us practice, bro, you would have said he just a walk on, bro, and he just happy to put on a Kentucky jersey. If you would have yes, been through our practice, we went through. So, but my question I got for you is, like, what's one of your favorite moments? I got one for you, but I want to know what's one of your favorite moments at Kentucky. It's so many, it's so many. You know what bro, I mean? We, we got had, so much. Man, we 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 had so many moments, bro. Like. I don't know, bro. And, like, I get I mean, chills. I'm, I get chills when I absolutely. talk about us in college all the time. Facts. Facts. And it's like I got my moments where, you know, we was on some hoop shit. And I got my moments where we was just on some brotherhood shit. Like, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's shit like I'll never forget. Like, mm -hmm. bro, honestly, my mo like out of all the dope shit we did at our time in Kentucky, bro, my, my, my most favorite moment was that night at that Drake concert. Man. You oh, remember man. that? It yes, was me, you, and Bled, bro. bro. Yeah. And remember, one person couldn't go on at first because they were they didn't want to uh, sign to an agent right there. I think Blade had to wait. Remember for a second, right, right. Because you had to, you had to. Because for us to go on stage, we had to say we already was going to the the draft. And uh, Booger tell you that story though about why we declared, yeah. like what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 
you know, that moment where we, you know, we all kind of hugged each other and, yeah. like, you know, us all knowing each other's background, all these, like each, all of us knowing each other's stories, like the struggles, the traumas, like, and us being in that moment about to take our next step yeah. in life, which yeah. we all dreamed about. And at the same time, we dreamed about it, but in actuality, it for us three, this shit wasn't supposed to happen. Like, yeah. Like, our realities wasn't yeah. this. Like, we wanted nah. the kids that, you know, were groomed from grade school to become these professional athletes. Like, we, no. th- we three project babies that got it out the mud. And that's mm-hmm. what... And that's what made that moment at that concert so special. Like it was down there, we came to tears because we were happy Shit for I- one another, and we were proud of you know of each other for the fact that we made it that far, and we was about to take our now next step. In our careers, which was being professional athletes, so uh, yeah, shit, that I'm shit did that, that was one. Of, that was one of my, my, my you know, that shit then there brought me. That shit then there brought me to tears just now, just thinking about it, cause I remember when E Black committed, and he said that famous speech. <laughs> I forgot What's what that? he said. Remember what he said? I can't think of it. It's on. It's on YouTube. It's a famous speech. And then we get there, and um, they were like, well, Air Bless will come. He committed here point guard. I'm like, man, I don't give a fuck. Like, shit, we're going to battle it out. Like, that's what we're going to do. I do remember that. And Cal was like, uh, you my best two players. Y'all going to get on the floor. And then, like, I didn't really know Bled and Bud met Bled, like, senior year, right? Like, senior year, no, Bled, I mean, a junior. No, I mean, no, no, well, you no, really no, found I, a bond with him. When y'all find a bond, like, really start bonding. Like, you probably knew who he was, but when did y'all get, uh, like, a bond? We've been knowing each other since middle school. Um, but I would say we started bonding like right after our, you know, our senior year. Senior year, right? Um, yeah, and it was also because for the most part, me and Blair were like kind of rivals. Yeah, most of our life, so it was kind of like I don't fuck with you, but I do type. Like, yeah. So uh, I would say after our senior year, that's when we really, really started to you know get close. So after that, we go to school and like they kind of know each other, but I only know book. So I'm trying to figure out like how to be cool with Blair. So. We every day pick up. We damn near about to take each other earrings out. Like, we battling every day. And then we all just came to this shit like we just going to be the three amigos. Like, you know what I mean? We got 3A for life. We all got it tatted. And, like, everywhere we went, you won't see one person by itself. Like, the study hall, class, the gym. We was everywhere together. And you build that type of bond. And like Boog said, just going on that stage. And, like, for me, kind of like I had it planned going into there. Like, I was going one and done. Like, everybody knew that for me. Boog. Didn't think he was going to be there. He thought like two, three years, four years. Bled damn near thought he was going to graduate college. So to be on that stage and know like I brought my brothers with me and they put me to a position where I could be who I could be. And like nobody over like looked at me like I was trying to be bigger and better than nobody. And I just tried to make everybody better and be the blueprint and leader for our team. Like that shit was like chills. Like like you said, being Project Babies and not supposed to be on this platform and make it out the way we did. And all of us go first round, bro. Like. That shit give you chills to this day watching highlight tapes where he was just talking about. You, it. you guys mentioned the Drake concert. Why, why was Drake around so much? Like he was kind of like looked like he was trying to be on the team. <laughs> nah, 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 okay. nah. So to to break that down, I think you kind of talking about like Drake later on in the Kentucky gotcha. years. Like yeah, we talking about Drake. This 2000, was two thousand nine, yeah. two thousand ten. This is when Drake came out. Like this is his yeah. coming out party. So. Um, Drake was, you know, still super under the radar, like, and that's kind of where the bond came with bro. Like, I would say we, you could in a way kind of say we were one of his first fans, like, in the beginning stages of his career. Yeah. And we fast forward to now to, you know, obviously he's a a musical icon at this point in his career. And it's like, that was also why that was such a special moment because – we're sitting here watching a musical icon in the beginning stages of his career. We're in that moment about to now take that next step in the beginning stages of our career. Like, yeah, like I said, it was just a really, really dope moment being there and seeing that and, you know, being able to think back on it to where we are now. Like, you know, everything played out exactly the way it was supposed to. And that's why it was such a dope, dope Hey, experience. you remember your iconic practice story? <laughs> 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 bro, we gotta put this story to rest, bro. <laughs> no, nah, I just, I just gotta bring that story up because rest in peace, bro. chief. You know what I mean? That was the most oh, yeah, story. Rest in peace, so rest chief, in, bro. Rest Miss you, brother. Chief. Love you, man. Yeah, yeah. but boy, gotta tell you this, bro. This is the last time we gonna nah, talk bro, about. Nah, bro, you got it. Nah, you got it, bro. I don't even so want to tell the story. Hey, bro. so we, so listen. For one, <laughs> for one, when we got there, me and him think we picked the wrong school. <laughs> 
We got to be on the line at 6 a.m. in the morning. Like, no, like, listen, listen, you're not listening. When 6 o'clock hit, you better be on that line. Like, not 601, not 559. Like, so me and Bud, like, we chilling. Like, we got, we share dorms together. Like, Bud like to listen to slow jams, go to sleep. But I wanted to watch Sports Center. So we having arguments every other night. Like, bro, turn the TV off. I want to go to see this. I'm like, bro, please go to see so I can just turn the slow jams off. He'll wake up and, bro, turn the Sports Center off. I ain't trying to hear that. So we get up by like 5.15, get showered, whatever, go to the court. We got to run 20 suicides in 20 minutes. Like people don't realize, like, I never understood what condition it was till I got there. Like, we do fake condition, whatever. So, book, feet start burning. <laughs> like, feet on fire. Like, fire. But, like, what y'all had to finish in, like, 39 seconds, right, book? Like, 38? Y'all got, like, 38, 39, right? It's big Bro, man. I Bro, I completely you scratched still- that shit out of my memory, bro. I don't know, bro. <laughs> I was, so we, I was as guard, sick, bro. <laughs> as guards, we had to finish in 28 seconds, and we had like 32 seconds of spare. They gave the bigs like 39, 40, 20 seconds of spare. But the shit was brutal. Like, we go back to the dorm, we like, man, we th- the bull like, yo, I'm, I'm thinking about transferring. <laughs> like, this shit ain't it for me. <laughs> I was like, bull, come on, bro. You're you going to figure it out. Like, it's just something new for all of us. So his feet start burning. He goes sit on the sideline of the corner, throw his shoes like, man, fuck this. I ain't running no more. Cal like, see, if Bud would have finished, I would have gave y'all tomorrow off. I said, Cal, you lying like shit. <laughs> I'm like, bro, you lying. You would have not going to give us no day off. So sometimes our, our punishment was you would have to sit at half court while the whole team runs suicides. Bug at half court, and they like, what we gonna do? Ain't nobody fighting Bug, bro. So we like, damn, we just, we just looking at Bug like he get to chill, but we gotta run. Like, ain't nobody fighting Bug. We all gotta jump him. Ain't nobody winning that battle. Hey, I did feel bad though, bro. I ain't gonna lie, I did. But you was cool though. Like you was like, yeah, you did. But you was like, you know what? Fuck it. This is what it is. Yeah, I, bro. But now nah, this would change it when Kyle told me like, hey man, listen, like it's cool. And you know how Kyle is. He always playing them fucking mind, mind games. games, bro. Like, yes, yeah. it's, it's con- everything is a mind game. So he came to me, he's like, hey, man, it's cool, man, I get it. Like, your feet hurt, they burning. Like, I know this is a lot of running. But listen, don't think you're going to be a starter here. Oh, yeah, he did. I'm like, like, what you mean? Like, He said, if you can't finish this. Look, and you know all the promises to get you to the school. And I'm just like, I ain't going to be a starter. What you mean? Like, you know, it's fine. Like, my starters can never get tired of running. They they don't complain about their feet. That's a fact. That's a fact. So I'm like, man, fuck, man. Let me put these <laughs> shoes on, man. Like, these are all mind games, right? This is what my coach Cal Cal, right? Bro, it's just this is what bro. Made he Cal plays, Cal, bro. Bro, this is what made Cal's Cal, bro. Like I, constant you, mind games, constant trickery, like. But at the same time, it prepares you for that next level. Yeah. Like, um, it's a it's a form of motivation, like. At the end of the day, he knows how to get the best out of you. Like, and even if he got to, you know, twist your ear a little bit, twist your brain, or make you feel less than whatever, he's going to get you to that point of where he's trying to get you. And it's always just a form of, you know, like I said, motivation. Like motivating you to, to, to push yourself to that next level. Get, bring that monster out. And, like, I, I don't think it hasn't worked on the guy no. yet. Like, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. It's, it's a machine at Kentucky. So, uh you know, his ways work. They definitely do. If it ain't work, you just ain't mentally strong, bro. That's all it is. If it or it don't wasn't, work, or it wasn't meant you to just, be. It wasn't meant to be for you, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That type of shit at work, because you guys only lost two games. And, I mean, you guys won. Three. We lost well, three. So, but the third. Two, yeah. two, Go ahead. two in the SEC, yeah. bro. Two in the SEC. Both road games, though. And then can, the I, can I ask you about I that still, tournament? Um, that shit. Because, okay, Elite Eight, obviously. I cry I like know. a baby. Do you guys remember who you lost to? Yes, Coach Joe Mazzulla. That blew my mind. I didn't realize that because you don't, you know, we forget about between playing in college and now he's the coach. What He had 17 that game or something like that? Bro, 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 that game, hey, hey listen, bro. Don't hold bro. back. I mean, the thing is. Ain't yeah. nobody holding back. That's what they you're not going to do. But, like, that game right there, bro, like, it's still to this day. Like, I be, oh, just yeah, be yeah. getting grudge about it, but. Like, they played out of their minds, bro. The first half, they didn't make no two-point basket, make all threes. We started off 0 for 21 or 22 from three. It just, like, 
It won't meant for us, bro. It just won't meant, bro. I swear, bro. if we would have won, if we would have won. Y'all know Joe Mazzula was guarding me in the back of that 131, right? Yes. And y'all motherfuckers wanted to keep shooting fucking threes, bro. I'm I like, shot, give I me shot, the ball. Bro, not me. I shot two threes, bro. They, I was at the top of the key. I was swinging it to the wing. The wing pulled to feed the post. I can't feed the post from the top with Devin E. Banks. To have, I was supposed to have 45 that game. Brother. Hey, Devin E. Banks. Joe Mazzula guard me in the post. Hey, Devin E. Banks at the top of the key at 6'9", like this. I said, yeah, Coach, God, I think you got to put me on the wing because me at the top of the key ain't going to work. That one, th- hey, that one, three, one fucked us. I ain't going to lie. You got to think. It's Devin E. Banks, Kevin Jones about 6'8". They had Deshaun Butler at the time. Six, and then they had six. The, Then they had the kid Smith, the J-, J. Smith, whatever his first name was. He was a center. like So they was athletic. And Joe Mazzula down there just trying to take his knees, like boxing out his knees the whole time. I had a double double, bro. Don't no, no, you no, 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 no. You let you let us you let us in no, you let us in scoring because no, I'm gonna tell you where that you let us in scoring because they start off in man. Man, you cooking them. We scored like the first 12 points, and, and I walked past Bob Huggins. He said, I'm not guarding y'all in man no more. Mm. And I was like, Man, they knew they couldn't guard us in man. I was blowing right by them having a field day. They no step up, I'm throwing the book. But I'm going to tell you what really fucked us up. And Boog, remember this. We was at shoot-around. We were so anxious to see Duke, bro. Like, we wanted to play Duke so bad. You right. We wanted man. to play Duke so bad I because Cal right. never got the chance to play Duke. You know what I mean? And the first time we really got to play him is when he had Zion. And they beat the hell out of us in Chicago. So, in shoot-around, we, like, we, was, we, we never overlooked West Virginia. You feel me? Like, we knew we could, be, we could beat him. But we were just like, bro, we got to get to Duke. Like, we got to get to Duke. Like, we wanted him so bad that we didn't really game plan the way we should have for that team. And they and they was an older team that exposed us. Absolutely. That kicked our ass, bro. Man, that they shit kicked hurt. kicked our ass. Yeah, that shit definitely. You remember what I said to you after that game in the locker room when your ass was doing all that damn crying? Nah, I was hurt, bro. I wanted to tell me shit. Fuck you talking about. <laughs> I wanted it too. But I'm, you sitting say next, to- I'm sitting next to this guy after the game. You know, we just lost. And I'm kind of like the – I'm the, I'm the, I'm the he thinking about said, coming back. I know I'm doing. No, not that. I'm not talking about that part. I'm not that oh, part. I'm about to say. <laughs> I'm the friend that kind of say shit at the at the wrong times, but I kind of want to break the ice type shit. So it's like he over here like in full tears, like hurt because we lost the game, and I just kind of like I'm like, yo, what the fuck you crying for? You like man, what you mean? We just lost. I said, bitch, you the number one pick. What the fuck you crying for, man? I'm like, so, <laughs> like bitch, I failed this. <laughs> I feel this. Oh man, I'll never forget that shit. And that was the like the dopest thing about you know the, uh, our experience there because it's like even me saying that in humor, it's like I look at this guy, the potential number one pick. Well, no, not potential. He was guaranteed number one pick, and the fact that he could show that much passion, that that much love, not only for you know himself and the jersey that he he has on at the time, but the guys around him and. Just to see that emotion after the game from this, like this guy that's our star player, our number, the number one pick in the draft is, I'm like, damn, like this is a really, you know, solid dude. And, you know, even though we do have our relationship in college, you know, you still learn about each other. You still, you know, figure things out about each other. And seeing him in that moment of like, you know, giving his all, you know, knowing that his heart was in the right place, his intentions were in the right place. Like, I'm like, this dude going to have a bright future, which he, you know, ended up doing. But in that moment, I'm like, damn, that's, you know, that's really dope to see. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I, so. I've heard on actually other interviews about Coach Cal where, you know, I think, Boogie, you, you had talked to him, you are considering staying another year, and he, his answer was always like, you want to help me out, you stay. You want to, you know, go and feed right. your family, take care of yourself, you go to the league. Now, now we're in a situation where NIL exists. Would, if there was NIL right. back then, would you guys have considered? Because you guys were rock stars. You were like that Fab Five type thing where Five. it was like Five. all the endorsements. Consider it. Hell yeah, I would have considered cause what I was getting in the NBA. I would have got that time. <laughs> I don't know what in college, what I would have got. Bro. But I would have. I'm, I'm going to be honest. Though. I, ain't gonna lie, I probably would have sat all four, bro. Wow. I would have got real comfortable <laughs> out there, brother. <laughs> I probably would be honest. So that it's a, like, I ain't lie, but it's a hard question to ask because – we was probably get what six, like six, five, six, seven a year, like our rookie year, first year. Yeah. It was like yeah. four, like six. We probably could have got that, like eight or ten for one more year in college. I would have said Fact. shit. Fact. And I really wanted to win the championship. Like if it wasn't for me going number one, and then this guy, like this guy right here, I call my brother. Like 
And I got to give you a flowers, bro. We're going to get deeper into giving you those. But our team wouldn't have been our team in the half court without him. You know what I mean? Because, like, me, I was the guy that was the fast pace, push the pace. But our whole half court offense was between him and Patrick Patterson. You know what I mean? Like, that was our go-to guys. And them being as dominant he was and being what they was for us made us who we are. But that NIL shit would have been tough. I ain't going to lie. Yeah, that like they just, I think they just offered Marvin Harrison like twenty four, right. twenty two million, try to get him to come back for one year, and that's what he make for four years. He gonna make his rookie deal in the league. He turned it down. Yeah, yeah he I mean, you already league. know how dominant Jesus you Christ. are in college, and we know how fun college is. You are making that money? Well, it was fun yeah. for us because like, and I and I was just telling somebody the other day, but like, Cal really told us every game we play, we everybody Super Bowl. Yeah. So the bullshit bank shots, hook shots, whatever shots they take, bro, they are making. And we didn't realize it early on. That's what I think. When you go yes, play for did. Kentucky, yes, play for did. Cal. Oh, yeah, that first game. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, we realized it right away. Yes, Who's that? Uh, Sam Houston? Sam Houston. What was bro now? No, no, no. That was Miami, Ohio. That was Miami, Ohio. Sam Houston, when that dude Corey Allman hit like 14 Corey threes on that. Corey Allman, bro. Corey from Allman. Baltimore. Yes, bro. Corey Allman. Shout out to Corey Allman, bro. But Miami yeah. with Ohio almost took us out in my first game because I was spending the first two games. That's when I hit the game winner. We almost... Got sent home. I was like, damn, we would have lost our first home game. Yeah, that would have been rough for us. <laughs> so how did die quick? So but what so how did you feel when you got drafted? Like how did that pressure come off your back when you when they called your name that night? Honestly, bro, like that shit didn't really hit me till later on. <laughs> and the reason I say that and when I say later on, like, I was in sack. Like, I'm like, oh, yeah. shit, I just got drafted. Like, but the reason I say that, and I'm sure you can, you know, piggyback off of this, but in that draft moment, as a kid, you dream of the draft. Like, you dream of it. They call you on stage. You walk across the stage. You, you know, you shake the commissioner's hand. And you feel like you're going to go in the back and, you know, group hug the family, everybody. Man, I walked across the stage. Went in the back and got straight to work, bro. Like, interview after interview after interview after interview. And I'm like, after we walked across the stage, we probably were in the back for, I'm going to say, at least three to four hours. Who? Just doing. Shit. shit. I was. <laughs> Boy. I was, yeah, I wasn't you, five. I wasn't you, I five. was mad as hell. Finish your story, but I was mad as hell, bro. But we back there three to four hours just doing interviews, like interviews, pictures. It was just this whole media like circus. So, and it's like it's not where they prepare you before. It was kind of just thrown at you. So by the time I got you know out of and the draft is what seven eight o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Shit, by the time the draft was over and we finished all that, it was like midnight one in the morning. So I'm like drained. Like so I'm like, well, goddamn, like this is what the you know. Like the NBA is, I'm assuming. So uh, for me, it was it was kind of where I was just kind of caught off guard because I wasn't expecting all these things to happen after you walk across the stage. Yeah. So um, yeah, that kind of answered my question. I was a little thrown off, bro. Like I'm like, damn, this a lot. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would just uh, the whole process was amazing. You know what I mean? Because just being in New York, you know, you go. A lot of people don't get to go there a week before and get to go through all that process. Yeah. Man, for me, it made it dope because my mom's birthday was on that Tuesday, you know what I mean? So, I mean, that Monday, so I got drafted on the 24th, so she picked my suit and all that out. And uh, just to see all the guys, like, I'm in the back, bro. I'm, like you said, we did for, like, five, six hours. But I hear, like, Boog go, then Pat go, then Bled go, then Orton go. I'm like, bro, what the hell <laughs> we just do? Now, we really just put five in the first round. And it was amazing because when I got there, Kyle was like, don't leave by yourself. I'm like, fuck you mean don't leave by yourself? Like, I'm going to take somebody with me. And the season got to going, and I realized what he was talking about. Then Boog names start going. And no lie, bro, like every practice, it was like at least 20, 30 GM scouts, whatever Boog at every oh, practice God, on the sideline. Like it felt like we practice. was under a microscope, so we couldn't have a bad attitude at practice. We couldn't do this. So it's like we, it felt like we had the social media eyes on us before it was camera phones and all that. Yes. That was amazing just to go through that experience. But like I said, having my brothers there with me that I went to war with in college and See those guys go to, like, only one that really thought we was going was me and Pat. Like, Boog thought he was going to be there a couple years. Bled didn't think so. Daniel didn't think so. And for all of us to set a record to get five in the first round, uh, that was that was pretty special, man. Well, we, you, talk, you talked about five players from your guys' team first round. Now, UK, known for putting guys in the league. 
So here's my question to you. If you had to build a starting five out of only Kentucky players to win an NBA title, who would you pick? Shit. Boogie, you go God. first. And, John, you rate. You, rate, right. you tell uh, us if, if that would beat your squad. All right. I'm going to go uh, Jay Wall, Anthony Davis, uh, D-Book. And it always get tricky with this three yeah. spot with me. Um, damn. This shit hurt. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the three spot always crazy, bro. Uh, Could you play the three? Nah. Never. Three spot. Who would I, who would I go with? Uh, it's so many damn guys. To win a, a, a college no, championship? NBA. NBA. So account for them. Yeah. Oh, NBA? Account for their, I guess. You know what? I'm going to go off the limb. I'm going with, my, with the bro, Kid Gilly. Nice. I'm going with Kid Gilly at the three, bro. Underrated. That's the NBA championship, right? NBA championship. Is that enough, John? Uh, you I, think? I like that. Yeah, hell yeah. That's enough. <laughs> what the fuck you mean? It's more than enough. <laughs> bro, I tell you, bro, like, I'll be honest, bro, like, it's the hard, like, the big man. And the guards, you could contemplate all day. Yes. And three man is where the spot is a little like it's it open. A little shady. It's yeah, like it a, little a little open shady. there. So like for me, what era are we playing in? Like small ball era now, or I, I when we came like, in, book? Oh, yeah, that's when I'm, I'm asking you. Like that's when we can answer that. Cause like if we going small ball era, <clears throat> I'm going me, Jamal Murray at two, D book at the three, AD at my four, and Book at my five. If we going small ball area. Right, right, Cause right, I got right, two right. knockdown shooters that can defend. You know what I mean? They gonna challenge, and I got two guys back there now. If we going when we first came in, I'm putting Gilchrist at my three. Okay. Got the same right, same. Right. I'm putting D book at my two though. I got the same team as him. But if we going small ball, oh man, you can't do nothing with AD and Book. They both can space. The, I'm putting Book at the spacer. AD rolling. And you got Murray and D book. What you gonna do? I'm just running. I mean, this yeah, show. A, we're seeing dudes from Kentucky every year winning. So it's like. You know, but like I got a second team that's even right, crazy too, though. Like I could go, bam, <laughs> I can go, bam, cat, De'Aaron Fox. Like I can go for okay, days. So what is it? Tyler Hero, Malik, Tyler Hero, Malik, Malik Monk. Monk. Man, the list like, goes is it, on. Is it bro. Cal just knowing the talent, or is it also just like you learn me, something at Kentucky? Like what? What makes you guys I, so successful in the league? I'm gonna tell you what makes it special, bro. All of us was averaging 20, 25, 30 points in high school. We all could have said, fuck it, we going to a school where we can be that guy and do that. We all took a back seat to be like, we averaging 15, 16, 14 points. And look where it all got us to where we go to the league and then go be back to what we was being as dominant. You know what I mean? Like, D-Book didn't start. A lot of guys don't remember Devin Booker didn't start. You know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy because, like, he finds a way to get you all to play together. In the brotherhood, make you want to compete and co play against those guys, bro. Like, every day at practice. Like, no lie, when we was at school, we would pray for three to four hours, bro. Like, they had to kick us out the gym. We was playing pickup all fucking day. That's all we believed in. But you just got to have a mastermind, but you got to have those players and those guys that respect each other. I feel like we all respect each other. Like, Bull McDonald's All-American, this and all Like, they respected each other. And I think that's where you build that bond at. I agree with that. You guys. Only thing I hate is, like, only thing I hate – it's like Cal ain't winning enough championships, but he's done so much more than just winning championships. You know what I mean? Like he's been a real father figure to a lot of people, really helping people get to that blueprint. Like he told Bull, like, you want to help me stay? You want to help your family? Go. And I ain't going to lie, bro. I could take it even further than that. He honestly helped kind of evolutionize the game. Like, yeah. he made it cool to do the one and done <laughs> shit. Like, that shit was frowned upon in college basketball. So, yeah. he really a pioneer in this shit, mm -hmm. regardless of, you know, how many championships. And, you know, that shit kind of – once you become great, once you become Hall of Fame, it's hard to sit there and compare you to the next guy because – Kyle has done so many iconic things to just help push this game forward that aren't going to show up on the Hall of, Hall of Fame stat sheet. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, maybe you won't be able to say he won 25 national championships, but the impact he had on college basketball would never go you know, unnoticed or untalked about. Like, so, um, you know, regardless of the championships, this Kyle is 
like an official, official legend of this college basketball yes. shit. Just because how he helped, you know, transcend this game. And the game probably wouldn't be where it is today without Calipari. And that's just the honest truth. Boogie, you, you mentioned. Shit, even the fucking dribble drive offense, bro. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, about to say, even to pick you off that book, I think like. Where the league is now playing small ball and ISO and go get a bucket, that's all you were doing at Kentucky. Yeah. Like if you couldn't like he told us, if you can't get a one on one bucket, come on and sit right next to me. You wasting Absolutely. your time as a guard. I agree. Boogie, you talked about A D, like you played in you know, New Orleans and to me that's one of the biggest what ifs. If you guys were healthy, full strength, what what do you think you could have done? Mm-hmm. I canceled that game off the schedule we played them, cancel. <laughs> uh Man, I think it could have been something really, really special. Um, I ain't going to go as far as, like, yeah, we could have been a dynasty and all of these things because it was a lot of things that weren't correct with the team at the time. But just as far as the duo with between me and AD, the chemistry that we were able to create, uh, just being able to both become productive, being next to each other on the floor because, uh, honestly, when the trade happened, like, in my head, I'm like, why the fuck would they team me and – Anthony Davis up and we kind of do the same shit and and uh, you know I ended up having a conversation with Alvin Gentry at the time and you know he just kind of explained things to me and it kind of you know eased up that you know that pressure of trying to make it make it work because one we had such a creative coach offensively uh, he wasn't afraid to try things he you know he kind of put that 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 run and gun offense in Phoenix that you know is kind of what the league, you know, turned into. Um, so, uh, you know, he allowed me and AD to, to play freely, to be creative. And, uh, you know, like I said, we were able to create that chemistry and that bond to where we were both dominant on the floor at the same time. And also we could just, you know, I can cover up his weaknesses and vice versa. So, uh, you know, it was short-lived. I do think it could have been something special. But, uh, you know, it's going to always be just a hypothetical. Hey, Book, how, how would you want people to remember your career and your legacy you left on the court? Uh, I think. I have this I debate mean, all the time. I think, um, you know, just in today's society and how shit work now, like, it's, it's, you know, we live in a time of what you've done lately. It's not really about what the full body of work. Mm-hmm. It's always about what you can do, you know, as of right now and as of lately. So, uh mm-hmm. You know, you just got to kind of grow to accept that. That's just the times we're in. But, you know, as long as I – like, my peers validate, you know, how I feel or what I felt I've done in this game. Um, it ain't a room I don't walk in when my peers don't, you know, give me my flowers, tell me I was this, that. It don't matter if it was an OG or a young fella. Like For sure that. And that's what, you know, stamps and validate that I know I left, you know, some type of a print on this game. Um and I'm not mad at it, like, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, I understand the times we're in, and then when it comes to the, you know, to the likes of, you know, the bigs of today's game where it's, you know, the the, the, the Carl Anthony Towns, the Joel Embiid's, the Nikola Jokic's, like, the Wimby's, like, the, and it's continuing to, to grow, like, uh, Chet, uh, just the list goes on, and it's like, um, I'm, I'll never sit here and be like, yeah, I was the first guy. To like to be that because that's just not completely true like I think I came in with my own style and it wasn't a style that you know the NBA or coaches or you know even the league was really accustomed to um you know they were more so with the traditional bigs like I remember being a rookie you know uh getting flack from my coaches because I didn't want to I didn't want to practice a sky hook like I'm like that ain't that ain't my game bro that ain't like how I you know I do my thing so um, it was just, you know, it's the time and the things. It's the era that I came in. And like I said, uh, these guys of today's game, they've just taken that that small sample that I tried to come in with, with just trying to be my own style of player, my, have my own style. And they, man, they took that shit and it's on steroids now. Yeah, ran with it, ran with it. Yeah, so uh, that's why I can, I never, and, and I can't sit here and act like I didn't steal from Pal Gasol, Carmelo Anthony, uh, Hakeem Olajuwon, Shaquille O'Neal. Like, I stole things from them. So who am I to be here and say, yeah, I did. I started this, this, and this. Like, when the Rasheed Wallace's guys, the bigs, been able to spread the floor and, and, and do different things with the ball. So uh, 
I think that's just how this game goes. It's going to always be a guy that kind of pushes it to the next level, and then it's going to be another young crop of guys to come up and do it even better. Um, we living in a time now, we'll probably – we feel like we'll never see another guy like Steph Curry. Like, we thought we'd never see another guy like Jordan or, or Kobe or – but the game is just going to continue to, you know, evolve and become better and better to the point where, shit, we're going to be looking like the guys from the 60s, right, right. if, if, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. No, no, not to them, but no, eventually sure. the way we play the game is going to look old and boring. Like, and that's just how this game works. For sure. Boogie, you, you recently said, uh, I think it was on PG's podcast, that you were um, cool with moving on from the NBA. So, like, what are some aspirations you have? Like, I've been seeing you do a little bit of the media stuff. Like what, what? What's what's next for you? Um, I'm still dibbling, dabbling in a lot of things. Um, you know, I'm regardless if my basketball career stops or keeps going in the NBA, I'm still a brand. I still have a name, and I and I've come to understand these things. Um, my name still rings bells across the water or wherever the case may go. So, uh, you know, you kind of get. A lot of guys that end up in these situations, and I've spoke with different people about it, like you kind of get in a position where you don't know what your next step is or you don't really know what to do because you're so accustomed to doing things a certain way for so long. Like, I was born and raised in the NBA, if that makes sense. Like, I came in at 19. Like, Facts. I was a kid, and I turned into a man in the NBA. So to now wake up the next day, and it's just like, all right, well, yeah, you got to do something different. Or – you know what I'm saying? Oh, well, yeah, now you're playing in Puerto Rico or, or Taiwan or whatever the case may be. Like, the things that I was accustomed to and used to, it's completely changed. And um, I'm a firm believer in, you know, becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable or, you know, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's kind of the stage I'm at. And I never, I've never been a person to put myself in a box. Um, I've grown to the point where, you know, I'm not afraid to try things and, and, and – see what I am capable of. So uh, I'm enjoying this part with, you know, just being able to use my voice, uh, use my platform, spread knowledge, you know, uh, put my opinion on the game and it actually be respected and heard. So I think that's really cool. I think I got a lot of potential in this area. So uh, I'm going to just keep it moving. But for the most part, just taking this transition from, you know, being a professional athlete and now being able to come home and be an everyday dad has been one of the most special parts of my of my entire journey, because uh, I pride myself on being a you know a father. I've you know I've dealt with my traumas as a kid, and uh, that's something I've promised myself since I was a little boy. When I have my own, it's going to be different from them than it was for me, and uh, that's just where I'm at in my life right now. Got to be like that, man. Having kids, man, that shit is a blessing. Absolutely, bro. Like, I don't know how people don't want to be around their kids, bro. That's I don't know how people did it growing up. Like, I don't know. I can't do it. And them them little rascals going to be the one that's going (laughs) to humble you. Like, outside, I got my warrior gear on, and I'm not really a firm believer in You a big teddy bear when you get home. You feel me? And they they the only ones that deserve that. That's just how it go. He over there watching Paw Patrol. Don't tell anybody that I told you. But I want to say that to you guys because uh, when I met you, John, only like a few weeks ago, like – Hearing that, you know, you're a dad, you're, you're like, take so much pride in being able to go to your kid's stuff. And, like, I, I'm a dad, too. And the coolest thing for me is that, you know, and I think he'll, he'll like basketball. He's already saying basketball. is almost two. But in, like, a few years when he understands, I'm going to get to show him, like, oh, I'm talking to, you know, NBA legends. And so it's crazy to hear you guys, like, man, I'm, re- I'm, I'm, I'm a dad now. And, like, take so much. Talk about it, like, with the same energy you guys talk about your careers. So it makes me feel like. Man, that's cool. I get to be a dad too, like my, my favorite NBA players. Absolutely. So. Yeah, me and Boo were just talking about this probably a couple of days ago and just talking about like find out what's the next steps, you know what I mean? Because like I'm in the spot where Boo was at. Like, do I go? Am I, am I getting a chance back in the NBA or I'm taking that next step? And just having a brother that been through it and went through it, you know what I mean? Having somebody I can talk to and I need that advice to try to feel like what's next for me, what's the next experience, what's the next gap. It's amazing. But like, yeah, being home, bro, pick, wake, dress my kids in the morning, take them to school taking a soccer practice, taking a boxing, the smile on their face, like, that's what this shit is all about. Like, this is what Absolutely. we played in the NBA for. Like, this Absolutely. is why we sacrificed everything we did that our mom did for us to get to this point. So, it's a blessing. I'm loving the hell out of it. I got this other all question, right. Book. How was your overseas experience been so far? Like, how you think it's been for you? Like, was it too much of a big adjustment or was it been kind of calm for you? Um, it's definitely a big adjustment. And um, <clears throat> I don't think it's something that's impossible. It's just more about, you know, 
shifting your mindset, like really getting back in that grind mode. Um, you know that that you know that mode you was in when you was trying to make it. Like mm-hmm. that's kind of where you got to shift your mind back to, and um, you know just being on you know at this point in my career now and now experiencing the overseas life and thing and all that. Like I've gained a whole new respect for this hoop shit in general, and uh, you know we think. You know, we sit here and complain and shit about, you know, the different things. And rightfully so. But, the, you know, the different experiences and things we got to go through with the NBA. But them dudes over there, bro, that grind they going through, like, they don't get enough credit. Like, and and now just hearing these guys' stories and, and, and seeing what they go through on an everyday basis. Like, even now, I can I sit there and be their teammate and just hear their story and see the way they grind. And it's just like, damn, bro, like. Who the hell am I to even be complaining? Like, feel you know like what we I'm feel like we were spoiled. Absolutely. And then on top of all that, it's just the fact that it's so much fucking talent out here in this world with the game of hoop. Like we sit here and we get brainwashed to thinking like all the best talent in the world is only in the NBA. That's a goddamn lie. That's a that, it's that a lot of nice motherfuckers lie. overseas. It's motherfuckers overseas. That will literally destroy motherfuckers in the NBA, and and I and I die, on, like I will put my life on the line saying that. And uh, you got guys like fucking Tremont, like bro, it's the the list goes on, bro. Mike Tremont James, Tremont Waters is one. Mike Tremont James, Waters like, cold. like these some of the coldest dudes I've ever seen with a ball in their hand, and like you know they may not, and it's not necessarily that they're a bad person or you know they they lack something. This NBA shit is literally about who you know and opportunities. And sometimes and, and perfect guys timing. just miss the opportunity. And timing, bro. Timing is everything. Representation is everything. So it's a lot of shit that kind of goes in into this business outside of just being good at basketball. Because I'm going to be honest, that's probably about 10% of it. Yeah, and, for sure. You know, the, the casual or, or – the casual fan or a person that's, you know, not as in-depth when it comes to this business, that's what they think. Yeah, just go be good at basketball. You got a chance at making it. That's not the case. That, that That's far from the truth. Nah. Because you got guys like Jordan Crawford, Marshawn Brooks that was in the league that bona fide bucket getters. And I feel like if they was drafted in this time now, it'd be the perfect role for them. You know what I mean? But when we that's came true. in, you really had to be – it wasn't really no legit six man like that, like that, like. But I feel like they could have been the Lou Wills or the Jamal Crawfords or like the Norman Powers. Now, it's just like you said, perfect time in the situations like that. And shit, even even the piggyback off of that, when we came into the league, five like small scoring guards was like frowned upon. Like, man, you had to be a true point guard. Yeah, you had to be a pass first guard to even. You had to be pass first. You had to have a certain amount of size on you to even play the position. So like these small scoring guards. They didn't even get opportunities. So, us coming up in the hoop game, it's plenty of guys that I know was cold, small, yeah. but cold. Yeah. Isaiah Thomas, our our generation, Isaiah Thomas, been doing this shit since we was puppies. Shit, like, Thomas, you remember Tommy Mason Griffin? Bro, come on, man. You know what? Yeah, come like, on, I'm bro. just saying, like, yeah, the, like. The original Hezzy pull up. Like, <laughs> yeah. Come on, bro. Like, we saw Ronde Hollis Jefferson this then, past FIBA, like. People forgot about him, Mesh. right? Yeah, right. He was on the nets, and Absolutely. then he was cooking everyone looking like Kobe. But that's why I say. I just feel like it's perfect timing, man. The league has changed. Like, I'm not taking nothing away from none of these guys. These guys is fucking talented, you know what I mean? It's just like we all be like, I seen Bud go get fucking 50 and 14. I went and got 40 and 14. And this is when the league was two bigs, and it was hard to get through the paint and try to finish. So imagine what a motherfucker do with the spacing as it is now. <laughs> Oh man! It'd be a field day, you know what I mean? So the spacing and and the physicality, it, yeah, it's you, non-existent. Now, yeah, so. you was out there getting put in headlocks and stuff like that. Like <laughs> all I did was used to attack the basket and average four free throws. I'm like, how the hell I do that? Like, I ain't out here shooting twenty threes. Right. But you know, it's the nature of the game. But like, all these guys are fucking talented. Like growing up, I didn't have a trainer. Like these guys are six years old, five years old, working with NBA trainers. So that's why they blossom and their game is so advanced. I go to YouTube, I'm seeing kid with more handles I ever fucking seen like Kyrie Irving at eight years old. Like, how the hell you know hezzy, hezzy, tween, step back, Euro they step? Like, filled. I didn't know what the hell that was. They were born. Yeah. Well, okay, so this is the last question. Yeah. And, Boogie, we appreciate your time. I think you stayed on here longer than we asked, so really appreciative. <laughs> Segue from the oh, last good, question. Man. Would you guys ever consider playing together overseas one last time? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Easy. Easy. Hell yeah. 
Obviously, yeah. it's gonna have to be a situation convenient yeah. for us both. But absolutely, yeah. But we absolutely. had we we've been had talks about this, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and like I said, giving flowers, bro. Like, Bud gave me my flowers. Like, I didn't know he felt this way about like how I handled myself in Kentucky. We was in Houston. Like, we played there. Bro, every day we just in our apartment just kicking it. Like, we go in the same food spot just kicking it. Like I said, like, I don't really call a lot of people my brothers. You know what I mean? Like, we all associates because we play in this NBA and be around a lot of celebrities. But I don't don't been to this man's wedding, when the best man, had fun. Like, my mama came to that. Like, there's a person, like, when he tore his ACL, bro, I was devastated. My next day I'm flight. I was with him for a whole four or five days. Like, just making sure he's there. You know what I mean? Making sure he's there. And that's, like the type of love you don't get from a lot of people. So, like, you know, bro, I love you, bro. I'm glad you came on the podcast, man. You know, it's, it's always what it is between us. You know what it is, bro. Love, always. Appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate you. Thanks yes, so sir. much. Yes, That's sir. been DeMarcus Cousins. Appreciate y'all, boys, man. Point game. Watch. I mean, just follow, follow the dude. You'll see him. All right. Welcome back to Point Game, our final segment the favorite bucket or brick. And as just as a reminder, bucket or brick is brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. DraftKings Sportsbook is your home for all things NBA action from player props to same game parlays. Check out everything DraftKings Sportsbook has to offer to make your NBA experience even sweeter. The crown is yours. Okay. John, we played bucket or brick on the first episode. Uh, just a reminder for everyone at home watching this, I'm going to say an NBA statement. And if John agrees with that, he's going to say bucket. If he disagrees, He's going to say brick. So, uh, you ready for this, John? For sure, that you know that. Okay. The first one, Victor Wembanyama, who's been impressive since the break. I mean, he's just like, you know, they call him the alien. We haven't seen anyone like him before. His odds to win Rookie of the Year are currently negative uh, 750, minus 750, which means if you bet $750, you win 100. So, he's a big favorite. So, bucket or brick, Wemby will be the Rookie of the Year this year and an all-star next year. Oh, uh, I say bucket. You know what I mean, I know Czech is playing amazing. You don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? He's a hell of a talent. He probably got the what, number one, number two team in the West. Uh, I just don't like the rule of you already been in the league for a year, even though you didn't play, like you get a chance to win rookie of the year because you got a full experience of how the NBA game works. You know what I mean? And you can't control that. Injuries happen, so I'm not blaming nobody for that. But uh, Wimmy's amazing, bro. Like, Stuff he's doing is un- – and I think ever since they put him at the five, the center position, he's been dominant even more. Now, I mean, at the four, he was playing okay, doing well. But since he's been at the five, it's amazing. He just did a move last night, went behind the back, did my move, and threw it off the backboard and tried to dunk it. But they fouled him. And I was like, nah, bro. And, and, and he's only going to get better. And I like – and, I mean, he's in a great organization, though. They develop their guys the right way. Greg Popovich is not going to force it. You know what I mean? He didn't try to play him 30, 40 minutes early on. Like they didn't try to put him into weightlifting and put a ton of weight on him early. They just let him develop it slowly but surely. But, yeah, I feel like he's going to be an uh, all-star next year and definitely wear Ricky of the year. That's my opinion. Dope. All right, big bucket there. Okay, so second one, LeBron tweeted this week that the media's got to give Bronny a break. So bucket or brick, a team, and I think Bronny's going to stay one more year. So when Bronny becomes eligible for the draft, a team will draft Bronny and chances to get Bron. Uh I say 50-50, you know what I mean? Because the team might want to do that, but at the same time, like LeBron said, I respect what he said because uh, it's just tough because he has LeBron James Jr., you know what I mean? He got the same name as his dad, so that's a tough thing. That everybody's going to have that radar and spotlight on him. But I feel at the same time, Bronny's a great kid that's doing the way he want to do it. Like, he's not falling into the media conditions. Uh, he's definitely not worried about money, anything like that. He's just worried about enjoying his college experience, trying to get better every day and developing his game. And, uh, you know, with this social media where a lot of kids fall into that trap, uh, I think LeBron and uh, his wife does a great job of that, and they team they have around him uh, do a great job of just keeping it away from him. But he's always been a humble kid to me. Like, I've been to a couple of his games when he was in high school when I played with the Clippers last year. And uh, he just carries his, himself like he's a adult already, you know what I mean? And uh, you wouldn't think nothing otherwise the way his mom carries herself and the way LeBron carries himself, you know what I mean? Been in the league for 21 years. And you never hear anything about him. You know what I mean? He's always keeping his head on straight. So uh, I think it's just a tough spot for him because he had the same name as his dad. But he's handling it the best way he can, just staying out the way, enjoying life in what he can, and let it do what it do. He can't control what people say or the narrative say. Yeah, everything he's done so far is already amazing. The fact that that pressure. And he's, he's you know, people are, like, digging at his stats. It's like, that's hard. Like, nobody can just do that. So, um, yeah. Okay, moving on. Bucket or brick? Now, I'm interested in your opinion on this. Kentucky freshman Rob Dillingham has been very impressive this season. So, bucket or brick, he's going to be a lottery pick this upcoming summer. 
Bucket for sure. Uh, he's fearless, man. I've known the kid since he was in seventh, seventh to eighth grade. Uh, he played in my John Wall Holiday Invitational Tournament. And, um, he was playing with Combine. Jeff McGinnis was coaching the team. And I was like, damn, who the hell is this young kid killing like that? Like, he was just small doing the things he's doing now. And uh, I just love that he got into a great situation with Coach Kyle where a lot of people thought, like, he wasn't going to change his game because he dribbled too much and too many counters and this. But, uh, you know, Kyle, like I say, he found ways to get guys to develop, get better. Uh, he's fearless. You see him last night. Had zero point in the first half, came out, made some big shots for us, made big plays. Uh, so I love the team they have. I love Rob. Um, I think they got a lot of guys that can go early on. But, yeah, Rob Dillingham definitely is a lottery pick. You Put it on the bucket list. Top three pick? I don't, I don't know. You know what I mean? You never can know how this league goes. It depends on which team get the picks. And shit, Reed Shepard just put up, what, 34 last night? Yeah. He put on the show. So they got so many talents, so many guards. They got a depth. They got. I love the team they have, man. I just wish they – if they could lock in more on defensively, they could, they got a great chance to win it all. They have bigs. Yeah. They can shoot the ball. They got guards. They got depth. And I love Thierro, bro. Thierro remind, Thierro remind me of OG Ananobi. And I'm glad Justin Edwards is finding his rhythm, finding his confidence now. So they going to get their stride going at the right time of the month. Are we going to see you on the court, uh, court side at some of these games? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I just couldn't travel the last couple uh, weeks. But I'm definitely going to get back out there and go to some more games. You know what I mean? I'm always there supporting, man. I love uh, the University of Kentucky. They love me back. I love Coach Cal. I love all the uh, players that come there and play. I love the coaching staff they have. I love the athletic director. Um, they just great people, man. It's a great school, a great place to be, and I love uh, having my name attached to that and uh, being in the history books there. That's dope. All right, well, I'm not going to promise anything, but if you enjoyed this episode, very Kentucky-themed, you might like next episode. Uh, John, I feel like we're getting better and better with every episode. It's only episode two, but this this seems legit. Yeah, I think so, bro. Like I said, uh, we just find a tune. You know, I mean, We find off how to feed off each other and knowing how to do what we do. Uh, and then having a the guest in that's just genuine, and authentic. I mean, I want all type of guests that's authentic. They're going to speak their mind. And uh, we just blossom and piggyback and give the fans what they want to hear. And uh, I think they're going to get a lot of dope stories. All right. Appreciate you, everyone. This has been Point Game with John Wall and CJ Toledano, presented by DraftKings. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe to the pod. Check us out on Twitter, IG, and TikTok. Clips come out all the time. Tell your friends, Hoop fans, John Wall fans, anything. We appreciate y'all. Peace. Don't be scared to log on, man. Subscribe. Don't be scared. <laughs>